Great. So, so if everyone can mute yourself, if you are a panelist. Um, so I'm going to get started now. Wow. So a lot has changed since our last Medicare for All Resolutions Coalition webinar that happened just four weeks ago. Even though we were aware of the concern of the spread of the coronavirus at that point, very few of us really would have anticipated the reality we now find ourselves in. Uh, four weeks ago, we were discussing our plans for a pro primary push for city and county council resolutions supporting Medicare for All. Um, but the COVID-19 pandemic has now forced so many of us into isolation and uncertainty. And it's also laid bare the failures of our for-profit healthcare system. We never would have wanted to be proven so right about how our fragmented for-profit driven system would put us at such a dangerous disadvantage to confront a global pandemic like this one. Before COVID-19, we know that a third of Americans reported that they or a family member avoided going to the doctor when they were sick or injured because they were afraid of medical debt or even going bankrupt. And now that as tens of millions of people face potential unemployment uh, due to this pending recession, uh, we, those people are also facing losing their employer-based health insurance just when they need it most. This really demonstrates just how cruel and nonsensical it is to tie our health insurance to our employment status. But no doubt these are very scary times and so we thank you for joining us at this critical moment and this evening. Now more than ever, we really must come together in whatever way we can to build community and to strategize about how we confront this unique challenge that we're facing at this moment. We must first support one another and respond to the immediate needs created by this crisis. And when and where we can, we believe we also must continue to build our movement to make the case for Medicare for All in order to better be able to fight pandemics like this one. We've talked to many activists one-on-one -on -one over the past weeks, and it's clear that we're all reeling right now. Um, but we also have heard a lot of resolve to do what we can to continue to build this movement and to prepare to pass local resolutions to support Medicare for All when the time is right. So tonight we'll hear from an incredible leader at the front line of different aspects of this crisis, and we'll talk about how we regroup at this time of uncertainty with so many of our plans and organizing now delayed. We're honored to have one of our tireless progressive champions in Congress, Representative Barbara Lee from California with us, as well as trailblazing Minneapolis council member, Philippe Cunningham, who can share their experience as uh, elected officials during this crisis. And we will hear from health experts, physician, uh, an epidemiologist, a medical doctor and professor of health policy, stories from physicians and nurses on the front lines treating patients. And we'll hear updates from local leaders from Texas and Connecticut and discuss ways we can support one another to continue to build the movement. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat or send them via email to bshanahan at citizen.org. Our panelists will do their best to answer them during the webinar or we'll also uh, follow up afterward if we can't get to them all. So let's dive in. Um, we are extremely grateful that to, uh, Representative Barbara Lee could take a few minutes of time at this critical moment to join us. Representative Lee has served California's 13th, 13th district since 1998, and she's been a longtime champion in Congress for Medicare for All and progressive causes. Her district includes Oakland, whose city council passed a Medicare for All resolution last April. And uh, Representative Lee, we know that Congress has passed three COVID-19 emergency packages, some important aid has been included. We know much more is needed to ensure that those who really need help get it. And we also know that Oakland hospitals who have been treating uh, patients have been uh, facing shortages of protective equipment. So we really want to hear from you, any insights you have from Congress and your message for uh, Medicare for All activists right now. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Melinda, for that uh, very spirited and warm introduction, and also for your incredible leadership at Public Citizen as you fight on the front lines for Medicare for All. And also to everyone joining us on this webinar today um, or tonight, wherever you are, I want to uh, thank all of you. 
uh, all of you who are incredible grassroots supporters who are really leading this charge to support our movement for Medicare for All. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, and uh, it's been remarkable in Congress to see how uh, our bill has, has picked up a heck of a lot of steam with, I believe, over 100 co-sponsors now. So I have to give a shout out to our co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, Congresswoman Pamela Jayapal and Mark Pocan, uh, for really helping to make sure that this movement has become part of uh, our uh, Democratic Caucus, well, part of our Democratic agenda. Uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, the hearings and the, and the movement continues to move forward on Capitol Hill. Because we know, and we see this now, in the richest nation on earth, it's a disgrace that there are families who cannot afford health care. It's appalling that sick, that sick Americans have to choose between filling a prescription and paying the, their bills. That's before this uh, pandemic. Uh, and it's especially immoral as we face this global public health crisis that families are forced to choose between getting care for COVID-19 and keeping a roof over their heads. It's a disgrace that for so long Congress has prioritized uh, in our healthcare system corporate profits over patients' lives. Now, I serve as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, and I see each and every day how um, this administration tries to erode the healthcare gains that we made. Uh, and they have all kinds of uh, ways that they're trying to get around uh, the Affordable Care Act, for example. Um, and we keep saying, and you all are reminding us day in and day out, that health care isn't a luxury for the rich. It's a basic human right. COVID-19 has highlighted these health disparities as the rich and the famous seemingly get tested with ease, yet workers on the front lines are fighting for a diagnosis. Now, when I was in the California legislature, I was a proud, and this goes way back to the day in mid-90s, mid I was proud to co-sponsor the very first single-payer bill in the California legislature. And that's why I'm going to keep fighting until we achieve our goal of universal health coverage for all. Uh, we should put people before profits in our health care system. Medicare for all would ensure that families wouldn't have to live in fear that a cancer diagnosis or asthma attack could force them off of their insurance into bankruptcy. So it's not surprising, and it's because of you and what you've done throughout the country in raising public awareness that 70% of Americans stand with us in support of Medicare for All. Make no mistake, the COVID-19 crisis is illustrating very clearly that we need this coverage more than ever. So many people are falling between the, the uh, gaps and, and filling and really uh, not uh, being able to even access their basic health care needs each and every day now. Um, I think when you look at uh, what we've done in families, the first, uh, excuse me, Families First Act, uh, we have to fight. I mean, we have to fight to ensure free testing for COVID-19. This should have already been, been covered in the first place. We shouldn't have to fight to have free tests for people who cannot afford it in uh, a pandemic emergency such as we're in now. And as more and more workers are laid off, more and more families are losing their health insurance, making it harder to get the care they need. That's not only outrageous, it's beyond dangerous. So uh, tying health insurance to employment makes public health crises like the like one we're in now all the more serious. As more people lose their jobs, more people won't be able to access care, and it'll make it harder for us to stop the spread. So it shouldn't be like this. It doesn't have to be like this. And uh, these gaps now in our healthcare system is very apparent, as Melinda said, is very apparent uh, to the entire country. So now is our time. We know the solution. It's time to pass Medicare for All and guarantee that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, no matter what. Together we can and we will achieve our goal of health care for all. So let's get to work. Let's um, make sure that COVID-19 um, serves uh, as an unfortunate example that we need comprehensive coverage uh, now. So thank you all for being here and on today. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Melinda. Here in California, uh, of course, physical slash social distancing and sheltering in place has been um, the way that we're able to, or at least trying to uh, prevent uh, the curve from getting even higher. But I hope that everyone uh, on this call is following um, 
our healthcare directors from from the healthcare um, and medical experts and our healthcare workers. Um, we're listening to our governor, our California health system, Dr. Fauci, um, because we know we have to uh, try somehow to tune uh, this president out in terms of the types of information that he's given. It's a very dangerous and serious time, but I know we're going to pull together and we're going to use this opportunity to make sure that this movement moves forward with our Medicare for all. And uh, thank you again so much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Representative Lee. Uh, before you go, if uh, there was one question that came up in whether in, in any potential packages, if there's some talk of if we could expand um, Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE for people who are losing their jobs right now and just maybe as an idea or if that's something that, um, that members, the Progressive Caucus is thinking about. Sure. We've talked about it. Uh, we tried in this last bill. Of course, we're dealing with the, the Senate Republicans, but we're going to try again. But uh, it's on everyone's radar, yeah. and, and we're fighting hard for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, and thank you for keeping up the fight. We're so grateful to you. Okay. Thank you all. Stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, we'll get through this together and move forward. Bye-bye. Yes. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, so now I'm – now we're really lucky uh, to to get to an honor to have uh, with us Minneapolis Council Member who represents the fourth ward of North Minneapolis, um, uh, Council Member Philippe Cunningham. He's the first and currently only out trans man of color elected to office in the United States, and um, he is a self-proclaimed policy wonk and fierce community advocate whose goals are to break intergenerational cycles of poverty and violence and to build community wealth. And he's also the board member of our coalition partner, Local Progress, um, that um, led the successful resolution supporting Medicare for All in Minneapolis last year. So uh, we're really grateful to have you with us, uh, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you so much, Melinda, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's quite an honor to be here. Um, thank you for your leadership. Um, it, you and Brittany, thank you so much for your leadership and all that you do in bringing this together. Um, and thank you uh, to Representative Lee. I know she's off the call. Um, I actually was a constituent of hers when I was in college, um, a humble college student. So I was kind of fanboying out a little bit just now. But um, so thank you for having me. Um, I want to share with folks today um, the process and logic behind uh, passing a local um, municipal Medicare for all resolution, as well as how folks uh, can really push their local electeds and what local electeds can do uh, during this crisis. So um, as a local elected official, um, if it was a pretty straightforward decision to support Medicare for All. So I represent uh, the fourth ward, which is in North Minneapolis. North Minneapolis is actually unfortunately home to some of the worst racial disparities in the entire country. Uh, Minnesota is one of the worst states and the Twin Cities in Minnesota, which includes St. Paul and Minneapolis, are uh, is ranked one of the worst places in the country for black folks to live. And so, um, and we really see that those repercussions um, when we have a pandemic like this. So. Even before all of this happened, this was a very obvious, straightforward decision for me to step into leadership to bring this before this, the Minneapolis City Council. Um, this action has the potential to support thousands of my constituents who are literally just a paycheck away from losing everything. And so um, by passing this resolution, Minneapolis, um, the city of Minneapolis now has included Medicare for all um, in their, on our federal legislative agenda. So I also will apologize. Um, I have a bunch of dogs, so you might be hearing them in the background, so my apologies. Um, so the, um, so another big reason um, why I have supported um, bringing this before the city council um, in Minneapolis is because um, the city of Minneapolis actually pays, covers the cost of school-based clinics in Minneapolis public schools. So we actually help provide uh, medical care, um, mental health, sexual health, 
and basic health care to thousands of adolescents in uh, Minneapolis public high schools. And so this is an opportunity. Um, so it's no, no cost, top tier. This is a way to be able to really help deepen that and expand it, hopefully to across all of the schools, just you know, thinking big about what's possible for what we can do at the local level. Um, as we all know, um, the folks who are the highest percentage of non-covered individuals come from low-income uh, families, and that's really what I see every day representing an area that is predominantly people of color. So that's what drew my attention to wanting to step into leadership is because that is exactly who I represent. This uh, COVID-19 outbreak has been an awful reminder as to how deeply broken our healthcare system is, particularly for those who already are living at the margins and, um, and who already struggle. Uh, there's a, a saying that says, when uh, America gets sick, Black Americans get pneumonia. And that is something that I'm really cognizant of um, as a local elected official because folks who are disproportionately impacted are my neighbors. Uh, when folks don't have access to these basic resources, um, the, when, when, when we don't have that, um, it puts us all at risk. So when I brought forward um, the resolution and actually, Fortunately, was not contentious at all. Um, everyone supported it. It was unanimous. There wasn't any big drama around it. Um, my colleagues all agreed that this was something that was absolutely necessary and, um, and supported it. Um, so now it's a shared priority of the city council. It was signed by the mayor and now it's a part of our federal um, legislative agenda, which means um, our lobbyists that work out in DC will be lobbying on behalf of the city of Minneapolis to make this a priority. Um, fortunately, we are represented by someone who is already a very vocal advocate for Mer Medicare for All, which il is Ilhan Omar. So we're very fortunate for that. Um, but, you know, we still uh, have some work to do with. Um, we have a, one senator who's in support of it, so we, we've got still some work to do on that end. Um, if folks are interested in seeing the actual resolution itself, um, you can go to the City of Minneapolis's Legislative Information System um, and search Medicare for All. Um, and the website, and I will type it in here, is limbs, L-I-M-S, dot Minneapolis, M-N, dot gov, and it will be the first thing that pops up on that. So um, what I would like to do is to also speak uh, towards how to mobilize folks, um, local elected officials. Um, it's actually been brought up, but local progress is a phenomenal way to be able to get local elected officials uh, support and um, a apparatus to be able to organize. So um, if folks go to localprogress.org, um, they actually have a COVID-19 policy clearinghouse of what other cities are doing to address this crisis. And folks can also become local progress members and be able to stay involved in the work beyond just the crisis. So um, with, uh, with the uh, local progress clearinghouse, you'll find some sample policies on expanding sick and safe time pay, moratoriums on evictions and utilities shut off, and other protections for folks who are homeless or undocumented. So, um, who are particularly vulnerable in this, in this crisis. So, um, so I would say that um, that's what I've got. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and again, thank you for having me. Thank you so, so much, Council Member Cunningham. We're so grateful for you taking the time and especially, and I know that this is a really uh, crunch time and, and difficult times for municipalities all over the country. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so, so thank you so much. Of course. Um, and uh, I think there were a couple of uh, questions in the chat. I think we'll move on, uh, but if you, if you can answer those, um, and that would be great. Um, so Happy I, I now so. want to, great, thank you. Um, so I want to turn it on now over to um, our, an ex we have an expert presentation from a powerful wife and husband team uh, next, um, Dr. Ronnie Mark, who's an epidemiologist formerly with the San Francisco Department of Public Health and now the Institute for Slow Medicine, and Dr. Jim Kahn, who's a professor emeritus of health policy from UC San Francisco. 
um, to share how the Medicare for All system would help us combat a pandemic like COVID-19. So I'll turn it over to you all. Great, thank you. So um, if it looks like I'm not looking at you, it's uh, because I'm going to do a little reading off of my notes. Um, so you'll pardon that. I'd like to take a few minutes to describe how our response to the pandemic in this country is indeed severely hampered by the malfunctioning morass of for-profit health insurers and the ways in which a universal single payer system would help us fight the pandemic. Um, the advantages I see are in three areas and those are data, logistics, and access to care. So starting with data, uh, a unified database with clinical encounter information would provide timely data, the foundation of fighting any, ep any epidemic. Uh, it gives you information on the number of people infected, the attributes of those people, so you understand who's at highest risk, where and how the disease is spreading, who's dying, and the successes of various interventions. Our current data systems are chaotic and are basically unavailable for this purpose. Excellent clinical data is the only way that we can design effective policies regarding testing and deployment of scarce resources, and it's key to keeping everyone informed. In Taiwan, which is the premier example of how single-payer enabled a data-driven approach to keeping the epidemic to an absolute minimum, health officials married clinical claims data to customs and immigration databases and notified and followed infected individuals and investigated probable cases. South Korea, Singapore, Japan, and Hong Kong have been similarly effective. And even in the absence of business, school, and other institutional closures, they have managed with their single payer universal healthcare system and database to really keep an aggressive and successful stance to identify, publicize, contact trace, and quarantine. Having gone through previous coronavirus epidemics, they also, of course, SARS and MERS have had experience, and that means fewer liberties for the population when it comes to governmental response to pandemics. Logistics are equally important. Uh, the kind of mayhem and competition that we're experiencing here among frontline health workers and institutions desperate for scarce tests, gear, and equipment would not happen with Medicare Care for All. Supplies could be systematically and equitably dispensed, and the needs would be clear and based on robust data. Lastly, there's access to care. And as we all know, financial burden on both individuals and providers, whether it's for testing or transportation or supportive care, would be a non-issue. Testing and care simply would not be allocated based on ability to pay. Obviously, Medicare for All is not the whole answer. It wouldn't alleviate our challenges with the pandemic entirely. In Italy, where there's universal health care insurance, there's enormous suffering and enormous morbidity and mortality. They have been unable to successfully stem their epidemic. In addition to Medicare for All, the government really needs to have emergency public health systems at the ready, personnel and supplies, chains of command that are alert and primed for action. Italy, like the US, waited and equivocated, failed to act, failed to communicate clearly, failed to communicate real information, and failed to implement a coherent and stringent country-wide strategy for social distancing and isolation before the virus spread like wildfire. So single payer is necessary, but not sufficient. Jim? Thanks, I, I've been doing research on an advocacy around single payer Medicare for all since 1994 when we had Prop 186 in California, and it's always been a, a battle to, to get people to think about healthcare and the needs of an improved healthcare system. Of course, many of us are, are aware of the system's failings and many people experience them, that, but most people under normal circumstances 
do have insurance and uh, mostly that insurance covers the care that they need. So it's always been uh, important to, to reach out to people emotionally to have them understand what's, what's lacking. I think what's changed now with COVID-19 is that some of the weaknesses of our healthcare system have become uh, profoundly evident. Uh, there was a story in the last day or two about a young man who may have had COVID-19 who went to an urgent care clinic was turned away because he was uninsured and sent to a hospital. And uh, because of that delay, apparently that's why he died. And I was asked to speak on uh, about this um, to some reporters. And uh, the point I made was, yes, this, this is terrible. Uh, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of other people now with COVID-19 who are suffering a similar harm because of lack of insurance. But this is um, really indicative of the broad failings of our system. As I'm sure everyone on the call knows, something like 40,000 deaths per year can be attributed to lack of insurance. And there are certainly more not well documented for underinsurance, those big deductibles that keep people from seeking care. So I think really this is a teachable moment. This is a, a moment for the movement to really uh, get people to understand that the kinds of failings that we're beginning to see now uh, in the under the stress of this pandemic are not new, they're just being more clearly revealed. And it is a, an opportunity to say, not only could we do better with the next pandemic if we had Medicare for all, but for all of those intervening years when there's no crisis, we could do a heck of a lot better with Medicare for all. As you all know, we would cover everyone with good insurance and save money in the process. As a health economist, we like to say, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but actually Medicare for all is a free lunch. It's cheaper and better. So let's keep organizing and keep advocating and use this moment to uh, move us closer to that goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marks and Dr. Khan. We really uh, appreciate it. And, uh, folks have asked for uh, notes from those presentations. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, then we could potentially put that with the recording. Uh, people would really want to uh, have access to some of the data that you gave. So thank you so much. Uh, and now, I've, now I'm going, I'd like to turn it over to um, Dr. Log. Augie Lindmark, who's a physician member of Physicians for National Health Program. He's an internal medicine physician at Yale New Haven Hospital with a focus on primary care and HIV medicine. And he's currently working nights, as I understand, at the hospital. And I believe he's calling in from the hospital now. So we're really getting this from the front lines, and we really appreciate all that you're doing. And thanks for sharing your perspective with us. Thanks, Melinda. Um, hi, my name is Augie, uh, and uh, good to be with you all. I think this past week I've felt, uh, I think what a lot of people have felt is a lot of isolation and in, in our social distancing. And I think it's, um, I think it's calls like this that kind of remind me of uh, the movements and solidarity of organizing is still taking place. And so I'm just grateful to be with you all here for a little bit. Um, I think, you know, as, as COVID has kind of, uh, you know, I echo a lot of the, the comments that have, have been said thus far, and, and as COVID-19 kind of picks up um, across the world, really, it's exacerbating the, the fault lines and not only our society, but, but also our health systems. And I'll speak kind of briefly to a few of the things that I've seen this past week and some of the barriers uh, of this health system that have popped up. Um, but I also kind of, uh, as has been said before, I, I think, this tragedy is, is also really an opportunity to uh, restructure some of the inequities um, uh, in, in this health system. Um, I think, you know, we kind of already have a number of pandemics going on, whether it's the uh, housing instability um, or the pandemic of profiteering off our health system. Um, and really some of the hospitals at baseline have been busy uh, and then adding on top of uh, patients experiencing COVID-19 um, puts extra pressure on, on some of the, some of the, the fault points um, that have been intentionally put in place um, by different entities in the system. Um, what, one of the examples that I, that I ran into last week was um, 
I work on a general medicine floor uh, in the hospital. And we had multiple patients that unfortunately couldn't get out of the hospital that were stable medically and had been treated, um, but we couldn't get them out of the hospital because we were waiting on prior authorizations from their uh, commercial insurance companies. Um, and when you think of a, a pandemic of really needing to maximize efficiency and also still provide compassionate care, um, the, the backlog of cases where people can't move uh, because they're waiting on authorizations, which are essentially uh, an insurance company's ability to kind of delay care uh, and question the clinical decision makings. Um, unfortunately, as, as a physician, I've, I've kind of gotten into the expectation that I run into these barriers with everybody. Um, you know, wouldn't it be nice uh, that uh, when we enter into a clinical space, whether it be a clinician or a patient, that we could focus on getting better and, and focus on, on health. Um, I think the, the pieces of, as, as COVID has gone by, there, there's also the uncertainty of what's covered that was mentioned previously, and this is absolutely true. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there was some legislation in Congress that required insurers to cover testing uh, for COVID-19, um, but it's unfortunate that we have to result to public pressure to make insurance companies do the right thing. Um, and that was the case with treatment. And you had maybe seen a few weeks ago that, that uh, Donald Trump had mentioned that treatment was also going to be covered and representatives of the insurance industry said, whoa, 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 we, we promised testing, not treatment. Um, that's slowly changing. Um, some uh, insurance companies have come out now that uh, they will cover cost sharing with COVID treatment, um, but the uncertainty still takes place where I get calls from friends and family members and patients uncertain of what's gonna be covered when they either come into the hospital or the clinic setting. Um, I think in any situation, pandemic or non-pandemic, um, there should not be that first and foremost barrier to questioning whether uh, there's going to be financial repercussions from accessing healthcare. Uh, and I think as this progresses, we're going to have to take a hard look um, at who are the people that are inserting themselves into our health system that don't need to be here. Um, so uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm grateful to, to be with you. Um, I think, uh, from a public health standpoint, it's been, I think there's a lot of in, intentional space around social distancing and, and those calls are, are very much needed because um, our health system is, is hurting, uh, especially as we, as we care for the increase of cases of COVID-19. So again, really grateful to be with you all and thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindman and um, Mark, and thank you for, for this, what you're doing and the risks you're taking and, um, and for all this really important information. So um, please take good care of yourself. Um, now, I, now I really want, I'm excited to turn it over to Jasmine Ruddy, who's with um, National Nurses United. As we know, initiatives to physicians, nurses are really on the front lines around the country, risking themselves to care for COVID-19 patients, um, many without a proper protective equipment, et cetera. And, um, National Nurses United is the largest union of registered nurses and a key partner in our Medicare for All Resolutions Coalition. Uh, thank you, ja uh, Jasmine, for coming and uh, to share some of the perspective of nurses at this critical moment. Thanks, Melinda. Um, it's great to be here with you all tonight. Um, so again, my name is Jasmine. Um, I am not a nurse, I want to give that caveat, but I have the privilege of being here to speak with you um, as an organizer, uh, with the Nurses Union and on, on behalf of, of uh, nurses in our membership across the country. Um, as Melinda said, NNU is the, we're proud to be the, the largest union of registered nurses uh, in the country. Um, and as I think maybe many people here um, know, but I'll just mention in case folks don't know, um, our union has been fighting uh, very hard for, for Medicare for all, for single payer healthcare in this country. Uh, for several decades, um, since way before it was cool, the nurses of NNU were calling um, for, for single-payer health care in the U.S. Um, and um, as, you know, just echoing what other folks have said on this call tonight, um, you know, we are also at NNU acutely aware of um, how this crisis is making the case now more than ever uh, for the dire need for Medicare for All. 
um, in this country, right? Um, I know other folks have mentioned some examples of patients dying because of lack of insurance. Um, there was a story about a patient who was billed $34,000 uh, for, for receiving treatment for COVID um, to pharmaceutical companies, blatantly, uh, just transparently making it clear that they're planning to profit um, off this crisis as much as they're able. So, um, you know, I think I probably don't need to tell folks here that um, the system is deeply broken. Uh, we are seeing the, the, the cracks in that system now more than ever. And it's so, so clear to, I think, all of us and, and to the general public that we need Medicare for all in, in this country. Um, even though NNU, uh, at NNU, we're, we're huge proponents of Medicare for all, and we have a robust campaign of our own in support of single payer at our union, um, as you could all probably imagine, um, we are a nurses union. And we are um, acutely focused right now on the needs of our nurses and of our membership um, in the immediate future and what they need right now um, to survive and to be able to go to work and keep themselves safe and keep their patients safe. So um, that's actually what I want to talk to you all about for, for just a minute, just to give you some experience, uh, to share some experience, sorry, about what nurses are experiencing on the front lines of this crisis. Um, I think it is not an exaggeration to say that nurses and other healthcare workers are quite literally putting their lives on the line, right, every single day and inserting themselves um, right into the middle of this pandemic every day just by going to work, right? They are risking contracting COVID themselves, passing it to other patients, um, and bringing it home to their families and to their children every single day by going to work. Um, this is made worse when uh, their employers don't give them the protections that they need to keep themselves safe. And unfortunately, that is exactly what we are seeing happening in hospitals across the country. Um, so just to share some examples with you about what nurses are experiencing right now on the front lines, um, one of the largest struggles that you may have heard a little bit about in the news, or maybe from, from our union, we're certainly trying to get the message out there. One of the largest struggles that's happening right now is that nurses and other frontline healthcare workers are not being provided uh, per, uh, what is called personal protective equipment or PPE, they're not being provided the proper PPE, like N95 masks, um, to keep themselves safe, right? Um, this includes, you know, things like gowns and gloves and, and, and masks, not surgical masks, which many employers are trying to give to, to nurses, um, but N95 masks, which are actually what they need to keep themselves safe. We're also seeing in far too many cases um, nurses who are not being provided with N95 masks by their employers because they're running out um, or because they're just not making enough efforts to, to secure more. Um, and as a last resort, they're trying to bring their own from home. Um, and we're seeing far too many cases of nurses uh, being punished and threatened by their employers for taking this action, um, you know, saying that they're being insubordinate um, or that they're scaring patients by wearing masks uh, that they're bringing from home when they're just trying to keep themselves um, in their patients safe. And, you know, this is all despite the fact that the science here clearly shows us um, that these masks are the least of what healthcare workers need right now, right, to keep themselves safe. Um, and yet we're seeing too many hospitals and employers um, threaten nurses um, and even, you know, threaten to, to fire nurses. Um, we are also, just to share one other example of what's happening on the front lines, um, we're also seeing far too many nurses across the country um, who are afraid to come to work because they fear that they are sick themselves, that they have contracted the virus, that they're displaying uh, maybe some signs uh, of symptoms, and that they don't want to come to work, and yet their employers are asking them to come to work because they don't have a fever. Um, unfortunately, this is being exacerbated by the fact that the CDC guidelines right now um, are far inferior to what is needed across the board. Um, the CDC guidelines are being um, far too relaxed on what is needed for, for nurses, and they are telling hospital employers that nurses can come to work if they are asymptomatic, which we know, right, is, is far from the truth, that there are, are many, many, many cases 
of folks who have COVID um, in this country who are asymptomatic and still um, are contagious. And, and all of these actions, um, they are threatening the lives of our nurses and they're threatening the lives, therefore, of all of us, right? Um, so that's what's happening. Um, I, I want to just mention as a side note that we are a union and I think that this moment reminds us of the importance of unions because we are seeing, unfortunately, um, a very divided landscape of what is happening, um, the reality for nurses who are uh, union nurses, right, versus nurses who um, are not able to work in unionized facilities. Um, the nurses in our union have been able to win protections for themselves, um, like paid sick leave in some cases, uh, even forcing Kaiser here in California to back down on its stance and allow nurses to bring their own masks from home. Um, we are not seeing that happen for many uh, nurses who are not in unionized facilities across the country. So I just wanna remind everybody that this shows us why collective action for all workers, right, is, is so important in, in a crisis like this. Um, so all of that said, I wanna just tell you all um, three really important actions real quick, and I'll wrap it up, um, that you can take right now to stand with nurses. Um, the first thing that you can do um, is sign, and I'll share these three petitions um, in the chat. The first thing that you can do is you can uh, sign and share our petition calling on the American Hospital Association um, to call on its member hospitals to stop this practice of threatening nurses who bring their own PPE. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do is sign and share our petition calling on the Trump administration to use the Defense Production Act um, to demand that manufacturers mass produce uh, PPE like N95 masks uh, now. Um, and the third thing that you can do is you can, if you'd like to volunteer in this effort and help nurses, you can join our volunteer texting team. Uh, we are recruiting folks to, to help us text um, millions of nurses across the country right now and offer support um, and resources and information. So I will pop those links in the chat if you want to do those three actions to stand with nurses. Um, and yeah, we look forward to obviously returning to the fight for Medicare for all like never before um, when this is over. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for having me. And um, yeah, it's great to be with you. Yep. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And we are so grateful to nurses right now and, and to physicians, but, uh, and definitely encourage everyone to, uh, to take those actions in support of nurses uh, right now. Um, and so I want to thank all of our experts and frontline workers uh, for sharing perspective on the movement for Medicare for All at this critical moment. Um, I want to turn it over to Brittany, uh, who will share some new resources that we put together in the toolkit um, on the Medicare for All Resolutions website and some ideas for more organizing and movement building that we've been hearing from our many one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with activists over the past few weeks. I've seen some uh, questions in the chat about like, what can we do for this moment? So I wanna, uh, we wanna take a few minutes to share some ideas there and we also welcome yours in the weeks ahead. Hi everybody. I, uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm sorry that we are all under these circumstances. And again, thanks so much to all the wonderful providers and workers out there who are literally keeping us safe um, and enduring these conditions like Jasmine talked about that are infuriating. Um, I, I actually, I, I hyacinth, hyacinth synchronized some hyacinths up here just to uh, try and bring a little bit of spring flavor to keep things a little bit a little bit light as we think about ways to organize for change at this moment. So before I introduce lo our local leaders to share some updates on how they are organizing during these times, I wanted to share some of the new resources that we are developing to help us build the movement that we will need for Medicare for All. I think somebody's got a, a feedback there. Let me I, okay, so um, so these ideas are available on this research page on our website, which I will share very briefly. There you go. 
very briefly share. We have put, and we will also share the links for this in the notes. We have this, um, so I'm guessing we all see the correct page, which is our website for Medicare for All Resolutions. Right in the middle here, you can see where it says COVID-19 resources. And we have two pages here that link to a lot of things and a lot of resources. Um, first, we have some resources for organizing, and then we also have uh, with, with a bunch of talking points and links. And then there's a specific guide to how to write a letter to the editor. So we will share these links to everyone. We will share these links to everyone um, after the call. So let me bring this back to where I was. First and foremost, in terms of like, how to get through this together. Of course, stay safe and support your loved ones and broader community by practicing social distancing and other measures as recommended by public health experts and participating local, in local mutual aid initiatives. And if that means making flowers your new best friend, I think we are all allowed to talk to flowers right now. Um, hold, another, thing is, another thing is just what we are doing right now, is to hold virtual meetings and gatherings with fellow health justice activists in your community during this time of social isolation, to continue to connect with one another, engage in online advocacy to respond to immediate policy needs both locally and nationally, and to make plans for connecting with local officials when the moment is right. If you need support with technology to convene such meetings, like on Zoom, uh, or if you want to talk through some of these ideas, just send us an email. Melinda will put my email in there and just let us know a good time to give you a call because right now we would love to talk to you. <laughs> um, so on, a third one is I alluded to earlier is to write a letter to the editor or to, or to write an op-ed to your local paper explaining why the current COVID-19 pandemic exposes the dangers and pitfalls of our current for-profit healthcare system and tying insurance to employment as tens of millions potentially face job loss. We've put together some talking points that you can feel free to use as well as fact sheets and resources from our coalition partners that are really, really great. Um, and then finally, uh, well, N not not last, but share share on another thing to do is just just share on social media posts and and information that make these links between the current response to the crisis and the urgency of Medicare for all. As I I I went and rewatched the John Oliver bit on Medicare for all the other day, and he mentioned the three objections to Medicare for all that we hear. The first one is cost. The second one is. Um, the second one is wait times, and the third one is uh, is choice, choice of doctor, and things like that. And all three of those objections are really, really clarified as completely baseless by the current situation. So now is a good time to use the crisis as an example. Um, as our cities and towns emerge from the worst of this crisis, you can also reach out to your city and county council members and ask them to discuss with you or your group why the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted this urgency of transforming our healthcare system and why now is the time to pass a resolution supporting Medicare for all. Now you will be the best judge of when is the appropriate timing for this, for reaching out to your council member or uh, county commissioner given all the things they have on their plate right now. If you are working by yourself, we may be able to connect you to other supporters in your area. Again, give me a call because this flower doesn't talk back to me. Um, you can also request to have a Zoom call with members of your group if social distancing is still required, or you can make a plan for after in-person meetings. That, that's possible too. And you can use the talking points that I alluded to earlier that are on the, web, the new web pages we just put up. And, and the resources that we provide in the toolkit in your meeting, which we can also help you prepare for. In person, Zoom, everything, we're happy to talk. Also, let us know in the chat or email me at, uh, Melinda's gonna type it out, bshanahan at citizen.org. 
if you think that you could write uh, an LTE or op-ed in the coming weeks or host a virtual meeting with activists, or if you have another idea that you'd like to share with other activists. So now, thanks so much for sticking with me through this. I wanna turn it over to, uh, I think, is it Morgan who's speaking from Texas Organizing Project? Yes, hi. Hi, Morgan. How are you doing? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, a special thanks to Melinda and Brittany um, for having us uh, speak today. Um, so I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, the organizing we've been doing at Texas Organizing Project. Um, if you don't know what Texas Organizing Project is, I encourage you all to visit our website, organizetexas.org. Um, we're a huge grassroots um, community-based organization um, that's fighting for um, the, to improve the quality of life uh, with low-income um, communities. So uh, what I do, I'm the Harris County, I'm the new Harris County in Houston, the new Harris County um, healthcare organizer. So um, a thing, a campaign that we've been running uh, specifically um, to fight to push the first expansion of Medicaid because Texas is um, definitely not a, a expansion state. Um, so the first thing we've been doing uh, is running a campaign called Sick of It Texas. Um, Sick of It Texas is a community-based organization um, movement that we brought together other organizations, but it started at top. Um, we brought together to tackle uh, the fight for the expansion of Medicaid and eventually uh, to pass the HR 30, uh, 1384 bill. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing specifically is uh, virtually meeting with officials on phone conferences um, in order to put the pressure on officials that have not signed up um, for the HR 38, 1348 bill, um, 1384 bill, sorry, <laughs> such as Johan Castro. Um, we've actually met with his policy director um last week or a couple weeks ago and we actually put the pressure on him as far as to answer the the questions that needed to be um asked such as why such a pushback um that he hasn't signed on to the bill and we actually got success from that we actually have a follow-up meeting with him um this coming friday so uh we actually included community members um in order to have them get involved and ask their questions that they have. Um, and we're gonna do the same with other Congress people, um, such as Lizzie Fletcher and Sylvia Garcia that's actually in Houston that haven't signed on to the bill as well. Um, so we're gonna continue that fight, continue to um, reach out to Congress people and set up virtual meetings with them in order to get down to the bottom of um, why they haven't signed on to the bill. Also, another thing that we're doing at, at top um, we're going to work on doing more social media engagement, so um, engaging, you know, young people as far as through Instagram Live feeds, um, and we're actually creating stories uh, to showcase the reality, but engage people to fight um, about why uh, Medicaid expansion and Medicare for all um, is the answer, especially in times like this. Um, we're also using uh, more graphics. So um, a couple of our members are uh, very talented graphic uh, designers and graphic artists. Um, so we'll be utilizing them and involving them in ways to come up um, to really engage the public as far as to inform them what's going on and why it's important, um, especially during this time of the crisis. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we're actually having a community meeting um, where we'll be including members to uh, basically find out um, what they want to see. So what does organizing look like for them around this time? Um, how can we engage other people and uh, what they want to see come through um, top and letting them be leaders in this fight as well during this time? Um, so we'll definitely be sending out a survey to our community members um, and really having them involved as far as how to engage uh, their um, state and local and federal representatives. Um, another thing that I know that um, Brittany mentioned uh, was also sending out an op-ed to local newspapers. So we're actually um, sending out our op-ed um, on April 4th, which was supposed to be our, our Medicare for All March um, <laughs> in San Antonio. So we'll be sending out um, our op-ed to San Antonio, Harris, um, 
and or Houston and Austin um, newspapers. Uh, and the last thing that we're really going to be focused on is just continuing to engage our community members and helping them um, engage other uh, community members and activists uh, to help out along with the fight and try to figure out virtual ways that we can um, really fight for and continue to fight, especially during this time virtually. So uh, thank you so much, you all, for having me. And um, we're definitely looking forward to continuing the fight in Texas. Thanks so much. And also welcome, welcome to our webinars. We're so glad to, uh, to have you with us. So we're also, so moving on, we're, we're also thrilled to have Tanvi Varma with Students for a National Health Program to talk about the exciting organizing that they've been doing in New Haven, Connecticut. Actually, I'm not sure that Tommy's made it tonight. I don't see Tommy. If you are in there, please send us a comment. So let's, moving on. We have, I'm very pleased to have invited as all, uh, our favorite returning guest. Uh, so the, uh, the, the Steve Martin of the Medicare for All Resolutions webinars. We have Dr. Bill Honigman from Orange County to share a quick update about our, oh, there's Tony, just a second. Okay, Tommy, you should be in. Hi, everybody. Sorry for the technical Yay, difficulties. We got it. Um, my name is Tanvi, and I am one of the members and leaders of Yale's Medical Schools chapter of Students for National Health Program. And so we kind of see our role um, in two kind of different pillars. So one of them is education and advocacy, education on campus. And so we try to encourage a discourse on campus amongst medical students, faculty, um, staff about Medicare for All. And there's a lot of misconceptions about Medicare All within the healthcare community. Um, and so we kind of try to dismantle some of those myths um, and kind of encourage that conversation um, through education. But our second pillar is advocacy. And so we have been working with Medicare for All CT, so the Connecticut chapter, um, to work on passing a resolution in the city of New Haven um so we kind of wanted to capitalize on the success of new london so new london was the first city in new haven to pass medicare for all resolution um and so we actually met on february 29th um in person at the yale medical school library to uh draft our new haven resolution and within two hours we will actually put this whole thing together which is really exciting um and then of course now within with covid 19 we haven't been able to meet in person but we've been meeting virtually um, and so we actually had two meetings, one on March 21st and March, March 29th as kind of organizing meetings over Zoom. Um, and they've actually been really well attended and I think partially because, you know, so many of us have had to be at home and also because I think it's on all of our minds right now, um, as everyone has talked about already about how urgent this need is for Medicare for All, especially with the pandemic. Um, but, and so we've been trying to brainstorm like what, how we can still continue to work on this while we can't necessarily meet in person. And so, um, one of the things that we're considering right now is actually hosting a webinar um, and the webinar would be kind of uh, modeled off of what was done by PNHP and Metro New York and SNHP um, where they actually had a webinar on um, COVID-19 and the, how COVID-19 actually escalates the demand for single pair. And so we're thinking about inviting family, friends and community members because I think the broader community also, I think, senses that urgency and doesn't, not, doesn't necessarily know how to put it into action. Um, and so we were kind of hoping that this webinar would um, give people the tools in our community to actually kind of do something and mobilize around this issue. Um, so this, this webinar is in the works. Um, it hasn't been fully planned out yet, but we hope that it does happen. And the second thing we've been thinking a lot about is um, kind of what information we need to, when we eventually do talk to um, city government um, in person. And so um, 
one of the members of Medicare for All CT had brought up that um, many municipalities in Connecticut are in budget season. And actually many government officials in CT don't necessarily know how much they're actually spending on healthcare for um, their, for government officials, for both their health insurance, but also retired government officials. It's actually huge parts of the budget that many um, city government officials don't actually know. And so that's something we can do now at home is like look through the budget and comb through it um, and have these numbers as kind of tools so that when we talk to government officials, we can use that um, and let people know because not many people know what percent of their budget they're actually spending on healthcare and how Medicare for all could potentially um, decrease that amount. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of our work right now is kind of happening behind the scenes. A lot of um, city government officials are also are also having virtual town halls that we've been attending. Um, we're trying to set up meetings while we can, but we also understand that this is a really tough time. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much our update. And what's also exciting now is New London, of course, passed a resolution. We're working on a New Haven, but a lot of actually different um, cities in Connecticut are starting to have this conversation. Um, so we know that Hamden is actually having a virtual meeting on April 8th. Um, I can put the link down for the Facebook event um, if people are in interested in attending. Um, the, even also in Stanford, uh, one of the members of the board of representatives of Stanford actually reached out to one of the members of Medicare for All CT um, to talk about what Medicare for All could look like and what would supporting a resolution look like. So it's a really exciting, it's a really tough time, but it's also a really exciting time um, to be you know, talking about this issue. Um, but I, our main priorities, of course, are to keep ourselves healthy and safe, to keep our families healthy and safe, um, and to kind of collect the energy um, and the information that we need so that we can go full force ahead when things look better. So thanks so much for having me. Um, and I'm so grateful to be part of such a great community. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. So uh, let me connect things quickly to Dr. Bill to wrap it up for us. Hey. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, and I just want to, um, for a moment at least, echo what Tammy said, that uh, priority number one is to stay safe and healthy. And uh, so I'm hoping that everybody on this webinar is doing exactly that. Um, uh, I'm an organized, I'm a retired emergency room physician in Orange County, California, but also an organizer with the group Progressive Democrats of America and our sister organization, People Demanding Action. And we're holding um, twice weekly now emergency online town hall meetings, uh, and in particular to discuss policy and the politics related to, uh, to COVID-19. So we'll continue to do that for the duration. Uh, I posted in the chat, it's every Sunday and Wednesday uh, at um, uh, 4, 4 p.m. Eastern and uh, 1 p.m. Pacific. And the information is available there on our Facebook page under uh, events for um, PDA Healthcare. For those who are on the phone, just go to Facebook PDA Healthcare and click on events and you'll see our weekly webinars. We're also posting those, uh, we're recording them and moving those to YouTube. So if you'd like to look back at, at those, uh, we just concluded our fourth one today and we'll have another one um, uh, this coming Sunday, but the, um, on the very first one, I presented a little PowerPoint on the policy and politics of COVID-19. So if you want to uh, look up that one, um, and then uh, I'm also happy to help with any questions that people have as regards the, uh, the policy and politics of, of this uh, pandemic, and, uh, and also invite you all to um, if you do know any like-minded uh, leaders at the local level, especially your city councils and uh, school districts who are all trying to get on the resolutions, uh, invite them to join us as well and we'll feature them in our uh, town hall meetings. Thank you very much, uh, Melinda and Brittany. And thank you, Jasmine, great to see and hear you also from the nurses. And thank you everybody for all the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill. Um, just, I want to end by just saying, I, I know we're a little bit after the hour. We've, we've covered a ton of ground tonight. Um, I think from the uncertainty and fear that I think most of us are experiencing as we face this public health emergency, but also tonight, uh, once again, I've been inspired by the commitment, resiliency, and creativity of our movement. Uh, we're 
physically isolated from one another in ways that are painful. Uh, but through webinars like these and others that we've heard about through virtual connections in our communities, we really can support one another and be prepared to take action however we can to, to respond to the immediate moment and the immediate needs of our healthcare providers, but also to transform our healthcare system. Uh, it's really never been so evident that we're all in this together, right? And so I'm really grateful to each and every one of you for joining this evening and being a part of this movement. Um, we will continue to plan to have these webinars. We will have one in four weeks uh, on uh, Wednesday, April 29th at the same time. And please let me know if you have ideas or for upcoming webinars. And, um, and please do stay safe and protect your families and wash your hands and do social distancing. And I do believe that, that we're going to get through this. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys.